I do think innovation, like building new things, is a way to disrupt the existing status quo. Balashi's, you know, kind of the world's going to move on chain. Everything is going to be open source. But I've critiqued this particular point, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier. If Blue America has its way, he will not succeed in, in building his dream of getting to Mars. I see guys like Elon really having to, to become hyper-political. No, you're not going to stop me. I'm getting to Mars or I'm going to go do this thing uh, in ways that they would not have foreseen 10 years ago. Let, let's just like jump forward 20 years in the future. What does this world look like? All right, guys, bang, bang, I've got Santiago here. Uh, I thought a great place to start the conversation is there is a vibe shift underway in America and globally. It seems like people are uh, upset with the way that the world is going. It feels like people are being left behind and they want to do something about it. We see this um, kind of presenting itself in things like Bitcoin, things like even artificial intelligence in the tech industry. But also it feels like there are people who are saying, wait a second, I didn't want to participate in politics. I didn't want to participate in the culture wars, but I feel compelled to, I have to, or else this is going to go in a direction I don't want it to go. You and your partners are all doing this in a very unique way. And so like, what is the vibe shift that is happening in America that has caught so many people's attention and forced many smart, intelligent, hardworking people that otherwise wouldn't participate to jump into some of these issues? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the vibe shift is uh, uh, kind of a product of a couple of different things. If we just look at the last, I don't know, 10 years, because we're, we're in the venture space and we talk to a lot of founders, people building interesting things is kind of where we sit. I think a lot of these, uh, you know, for the last, let's say, 10 years or so, especially in the frothing markets of uh, the 2010s, you could build, you could try to build something cool, a rocket ship, an interesting company, and just kind of generally keep your head down. I, mean, I remember interviewing and chatting with people at, you know, very large uh, billion dollar corporations now, and, and I'd ask them about some cultural issues. This was five years, five, six years ago. And they'd say, you know, I just keep my head down. I just kind of like build. And I think... That strategy, I don't think it was ever going to work, but there was a time in which it seemed to work um, because you could, the, 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 the political and sort of like cultural battles of today weren't as heightened or as explicit at, uh, at the time as they're now. I think people are finding, like, especially competent, uh, competent guys for the most part, but competent, extremely high quality guys are finding that keeping your head down is just not a strategy anymore. And like where you work, what you're building, who you, you know, where you live, uh, like your community, all that stuff really matters. And it has a very, um, like it shapes the world in which you want to live and it shapes the country in a particular direction, like what you're spending your effort and your money and your capital and your, your intelligence building. Uh, and so uh, what we're doing, kind of what, what we're seeing with the vibe shift is uh, competent people, let's say up to, again, five years ago, will just keep their head down and build. In large part, there was a, you know, frothy markets. If you could just keep your head down and build, maybe you could hit an IPO or whatever. Now things are so nuts that uh, you just need to be explicit about what you believe. And there's actually in increasingly an ecosystem, and this is where, where we sit, that supports people to do that. Um, and that uh, want to take advantage of, of the cultural and political headwinds that are changing. Now, as these people are um, trying to figure out which way the wind is blowing, if you will, um, what are some of the big red flags or the alarms that are going off that have really caught your attention or new founding's attention? Like, what are the things that you guys are like, all right, enough is enough. Like, we have to do something. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we've, we've identified sort of, as far as the founding goes, we've identified three macro threats that I think resonate with a lot of people. Um, and these are things that are increasingly just noticeable, like tangible in our, in our, in our culture today. One of them is uh, increase in globalization, sort of global disruption, where people, you know, you're trying to build something in America, but like what happens across the, country, across the world has direct effects to your life in ways that you may not want, may, ways that you may not care about. But it, the reality is like, you know, whatever's going on in the Middle East or whatever's going on in, in China, whatever's good, it will just disrupt your life in, in significant ways. So that's one of the macro threats. The other is an increase in bureaucratization. And so red flag that, that guys are sort of opting out of is this increase in uh, what, what the, 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 you know, anons would call the longhouse, but it's just this move towards bureaucratization that 
stifles any kind of innovation, that kind of vitality that young men in particular have, where they want to just go build really cool, great things, like take big swings. That's just not allowed in large corporations. And in general, it's like it's it's seen as like we've, we've entered a sort of age, especially AI, you can see this, an age of safetyism where like the questions are like, what can we build? Why should we disrupt in, you know, the current power st structures or uh, uh, technologies? Like it's more like, ah, that's too scary. Ah, that's, you know, that's uh, taking us to places we don't want to go. So let's pump the brakes on innovation. Let's pump the brakes on, on, on guys building cool things and uh, not go the direction. So globalization, bureaucratization. And the last one is, increase in um in political and cultural alienation like these companies uh, you know the recent ousting of uh, press and gay from harvard like institutions that were thought to be sort of neutral on the one hand which again was not never going to be the case but neutral and or just undying like eternal institutions like college like prestigious colleges or corporations or or, or what have you are ideologically captured and they increasingly do not provide the value that they would have provided back in the day. I mean, the, the whole world has changed in this regard. Harvard, again, good example of this, where old credential mechanisms are just devalued. Like now a recommendation from a highly credible person, a trust-based recommendation on somebody can be worth much more than like a you know a Harvard degree. If, if someone says, Pomp, you should hire this guy. He, didn't, he doesn't have an elite background, but he's the best operator you could ever possibly want for your business. Like that's more valuable if you trust the person making the recommendation than just having the right diploma, right? And so uh, these are so again the increase in globalization, bureaucratization, and then the, uh, the the ideological capture of of institutions are red flags that are making guys just say, "I'm out." Like I'm opting out of the system and looking to look to break out of uh, out of existing sort of hierarchy or power structures and build something. Build something new. That's that's also where we're betting in a sense. Um, and so uh, I can talk a little bit more about how how we respond to those themes. But those are the red flags that that sort of high quality, competent, dynamic guys are are observing and are ready to opt out of. How much of this is self inflicted wounds by the United States and by politicians and some of these bureaucratic organizations versus uh, maybe it is global competition or, or kind of external, um, you know, pressures, if you will? Like, is it just us getting too fat and happy and kind of the old, you know, hard times uh, make strong men right. and, and now we're in easy times? So we have weak people do, with weak leadership uh, and that's screwing us? Or is there actually some sort of geopolitical chess game that's getting played? And and so we're having not unforced errors, we're, we're kind of more responding to the world. I, mean, I think it's a little bit of both, right? So like uh, examples abound of China uh, taking advantage of the sort of cracks in the in, in, in our psyche and our national ethos to come in and, you know, everything from the, the border stuff that's happening right now, all the way to like using TikTok to uh, essentially psyop a young generation of, of, of Americans into uh, radical ideological uh, uh, brainwashing, if you would. Like these are, these are there will be trends that are national uh, and that are our own, our own fault, but that, that are taken advantage by external bad actors. Uh, internally, I think, uh, a lot of this you see, it is a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, I had a somewhat of a, of a friendly, but uh, uh, back and forth with Paul Graham recently on Twitter, where there was this, um, there, he, you know, there was a vile, he didn't tweet the original thread, but there was a vile thread about like Zoomers getting more and more right wing and based and then Zoomer, or Zoomer boys and then Zoomer girls increasingly more liberal. And uh, and Paul tweeted something like, "Oh, this is just has a this has a simple, boring explanation. Boys are just spending more time on playing video games, and girls are they, girls don't get to hang out with the boys as much." And I was like, I just, "That's not the answer. Like that's a that's a symptom of of the uh, of the problem." But the shortest way I can put the problem is like a bunch of these guys are just fed up with, and they see the lies, they see the uh, the the. Uh, the falsehood of just mo liberal modernity in its way, where again, it zaps them out of vitality. Everything is your fault. Uh, you know, if you're a young guy who wants to build something interesting, no, you're actually an oppressor. Uh, no, you, uh, you, if you want to be credentialed, you have to subsume yourself to these existing power structures or credentialing uh, uh, institutions. 
all of these things have contributed over generations to uh, just sort of the cultural and political stagnation that we're in today. Uh, and then bad actors, foreign ones, will take advantage of, uh, of the cracks and attack us, make things worse. As people are uh, trying to solve these problems, how much of it is a social, a social problem, a political problem versus a technology and like coordination problem? You know, is, and I really kind of think of that as like, do you have to be part of the system to create a solution or can you be outside of the system and create the solution? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, in some cases, I think th there was a period of time where I, I, a lot of us were trying to, and it depends on the institution, but a lot of, a lot of us were trying to reform existing institutions. There are good things to be salvaged. Um, there are good things to be to be reformed. In some cases, though, I think the the, the framing uh, of an institution itself, or the way it was set up, or, or what it produces, either is no longer relevant in a good way, or is just rotten to the core that it needs to be it needs to be disrupted. Um, so, and and the the solution, I mean, fundamentally. This is where maybe I differ with some of the like techno optimists like Mark or uh, Mark Andreessen or the EAC folks, where the solution is never going to be unfettered technological innovation on its own. There always needs to be, uh, but human beings are, we're made in the image of God. So there's going to be a spiritual component to it. And there's going to be uh, a, a cultural aspect to it. And there's going to be, uh, you know, different pieces, different, um, different parts that make up the whole solution to, to the problem. Uh, I do think innovation, like building building new uh, new things, is a way to disrupt the existing status quo. So, to give you an example, um, when you when you have a political stalemate, when you have a cultural uh, gridlock, the way we kind of have today, there's ways out of that gridlock that are scary and really violent. And I mean scary in the like, not in the like. Uh, I'm just you know. Uh, I don't like uh, interesting things. I mean, like real bad. I get things get really, really bad. We had Eric Prince on our podcast, and he's talking about. Uh, he was talking about when if you go off, if we go off the constitutional script, things get gnarly really fast. And so there's a way in which just any nation, uh, if you look at history, any nation has co cultural political gridlock, can come out of that gridlock or that stalemate through just violence and uh, uh, just some you know, terrible ways to break that gridlock. Another way is you use a lever like uh, technology, you use a lever like innovation, which provides uh, the same kind in, in some ways, uh, uh, same kind of disruption or better in some ways because you don't use violence, but it allows you to break that gridlock, break that stalemate. So examples, I mean, there's so many examples of this, but I think of uh, situations like in, uh, in the Reformation where you have a, a continent-wide uh, gridlock uh, this political, cultural, there's also a, a very strong religious or theological aspect to it. And then the invention of the printing press in the late 1400s becomes this technological piece of innovation that sort of helps to break apart the order, the, the, the old order, and enables without violence, I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of innovation and tech, technology, allows uh, the, the, the sl uh, smaller but disenfranchised and highly motivated and come uh, uh, newcomers to disrupt the incumbents with technology. Uh, now, there's no to say there was not you know uh, violence surrounding the, the Reformation in general, but that's an example of, of of how you can use technology to disrupt a, a political or cultural stalemate, as opposed to using something like like just full out violence. Are there one or two things? in terms of solutions to these problems that you all feel like are the big lever points or the big like inflection points where there's a hundred problems, right? These are the two, if we nail these, the other ones, you know, either are not as important or it's kind of like an 80, 20, you know, 20% of the actual problems gives 80% of the value. And so we should focus on those. Yeah. That great question. So I, I mentioned earlier, the three macro threats that we sort of identify global, you know, increasing globalization and global chaos, bureaucratization and then political and cultural uh, you know, capture or, or uh, uh, divide. So our response to those, those three threats um, are, our responses to those three threats are, so to globalization, it's a focus on the local, the uh, communal, the national, and, and the national. Like, so as opposed to global and globalism, we look for, uh, we focus on local, localism, 
and uh, you know, national self-determination. As opposed to bureaucratization, we look for uh, opportunities or themes where there's skin in the game or uh, a return to the entrepreneurial mindset. So where, where you really have skin in the game, you put yourself in a position where you own the results of the work you do, the companies that you build. And then lastly, um, the as opposed to the cultural and ideological divide that increasingly exists, is a return to uh, American political Christian ideas. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of people in the movement, if we call it that, that are that you don't need to be a Christian to be a part of this. But there is a there is a return to the founding ideas of the country, and the country was was founded in deeply Protestant uh, Christian principles that allowed us to uh, to enjoy sort of the uh, the the fruits that we have today. Um, so what we see is, as, as things we want to focus on are people building in those themes. Uh, the, there's the companies, the founders, the things that we start ourselves, uh, the, the uh, founders that we back are in the center of that Venn diagram of skin in the game, uh, focus on the local, on the national self-determination, and then on a return to uh, classical American uh, Protestant ideas. Uh, we're we're right in that center, and we see that uh, why we focus on those is, and it's different. We play well with the American dynamism folks, and we play well with uh, the founders, fun guys, and all of those kind of like increasingly pro-American uh, uh, venture firms. Uh, but our edge is going to be a little bit different, uh, partly because of our network, and I can talk about that in a second. But partly because we'll focus on tools and solutions that will. Uh, enable a large dis disenfranchised but highly motivated, in many cases highly religious, group of uh, consumers to become early adopters. An example of this in the historical sense would be uh, probably one of the greatest technological inventions of, the, of, of all time, if you want to use that term, which is the United States. It was a uh, legal and national tech innovation, like just completely disruptive in, in terms of how uh, people and countries organize themselves. And the first wave of early adopters was a highly disenfranchised, highly motivated and religious uh, group that wanted to take advantage of this new technology, um, that legal innovation, you know, national innovation, uh, social innovation, and use it to lever uh, against a uh, incumbent empire. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we will focus on companies that are building in those themes and places where we can help accelerate the adoption of these, these tools and technologies through our connections with uh, customers who are ready to, to, to jump onto new solutions. One of the lines in your guys' website is, we build and back companies defined by American ideals and a positive national vision. Yeah. Um, I almost cringe having to ask this, but are there people who have a negative national vision? And what does it mean to have a positive national vision? Is that just you want us to be in a better place in the future or is there right. more concrete you know kind of components that go into that yeah so this is part of the vibe shift and uh, let me let me answer that by giving you a little bit of context about something that's interesting about new founding so something that's interesting about new founding why people are drawn to new founding is that we we've been pretty public about our our just sort of political views uh earlier than it was uh than it was uh popular as it were um and what we've what, what we've managed to do is through the, just sort of the team and the connections, the people that we interact with, the the network that New Founding operates in is we're at the center of a, another Venn diagram of interesting circles. We one of our of the circles that sort of overlaps on New Founding is venture tech. Uh, we have deep background there. We work with all these guys. Another circle would be like crypto, everything from Bitcoin all the way to just the the edge edge folks building, you know, trying to conceptualize the network state and trying to do something interesting with those concepts, uh, and building decentralized technologies and whatnot. Another circle would be uh, just sort of the Christian Christian right, the uh, again dissatisfied, uh, disenfranchised religious groups who are uh, in many ways have been calling out some of these themes that we're seeing now today culturally and politically didn't have the, the credibility or the status hierarchy in the old status hierarchy to be able to disrupt to do anything about it. They were low class, essentially. And then the last group that we uh, we overlap with are the just sort of cultural and political junk, uh, junkies, the, the people who, again, maybe not religious, but I've been calling the, the, uh, the political uh, playbook uh, 
you know, for a while and got it right. So we're at the center of all those groups. And so what's interesting, you asked the question about are the people who have a, a negative vision of, of the country. Across those groups, we also get to see the negative versions of those. In tech and so, in Silicon Valley, you're, and increasingly, we see this with the, the responses to anyone building in AI or building in crypto on the other side, is just a, there's a vision about the, the country that is deeply just anti-human, that is anti-flourishing, that uh, would rather uh, sort of sabotage the country uh, and the, the, the spirit of innovation and pursuit of greatness that exists, that has, that has essentially animated everything from uh, the, the early adopters that came in the Mayflower all the way to westward expansion in the 1800s, uh, that would rather sabotage that than give up old and decrepit power structures. And so AI, and again, take, think about those, those circles that we overlap in. On the tech side, there's a lot of new technologies that are emerging that are a threat to existing power structures. Uh, Mark's written about this. A bunch of people have essentially called this out, and they're right. Uh, the the uh, uh, people in DC and other places, uh, you know, academics like Claudine Gay, they should be they should be afraid in a sense of things like AI because it will it will expose that you plagiarized or that you uh, your credibility or that your uh, your power was actually not built on real things but on taking advantage of old uh, and in many ways synthetic like power structures and credential and mechanisms, um, and so th there are people on the innovation side that have a deeply negative. Uh, view of the country. There are people obviously on the cultural side that have a deeply negative uh, vision for the country, a vision where you can't speak, you can't say what you believe, you can't ask basic questions about uh, how societies are structured, uh, where you know the nuclear family, where just normal people are uh, are a threat. Uh, that's part of the vibe shift that that I've been noticing and that we've all been noticing is that people who were uh, not even People who are just normal people, you know, five years ago are now branded as being far right or alt right or whatever, just because they're holding on to normal, just absolutely normal views about reality, how men and women should work, how families should operate, the kinds of business that you should start, that you should be able to, to, to say something, you have a question. That's just now fringe. Uh, and so the, the negative vision that we're sort of fighting against is one that is deeply anti human, is anti innovation would rather, again, sabotage the country, uh, the spirit of, of what's made America great, than give up old and failing power and credentialing structures. That's, that's the way I could put it. So there's another line um, on the website. We explicitly oppose DEI and ESG and the bureaucratization of American business culture. DEI and ESG, in some people's mind, that's the religion. You, you yeah. fall in line or, uh, or you're on the outside. Um, to others, it is complete nonsense and actually a, a negative thing. It sounds like you guys are in the latter camp. So talk a little bit about those two uh, thought processes. And, and they've really kind of seeped. Uh, you know, th there's the old uh, Goldman Sachs, like the tentacles, the octopus. Yes. Uh, I, I think a lot about like DEI and ESG have seeped their way with their tentacles into all sorts of uh, business culture and organizations. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Espresso, the maker of the world's thinnest portable display. Now listen up. If you're like me, you feel like you are at a command center when you sit down at your desk. I got a gazillion tabs open and different windows for different activities. There's my web browser, my text messages, I have Slack open, and I got a notes app. I normally work on a desktop and it can be very, very productive. But everything falls apart the second I leave my desk. If I'm traveling, if I go to a coffee shop to do some work, or just want to work from the kitchen table, my laptop doesn't have enough screen space. I lose my command center and my productivity falls off a cliff. It's a major problem. But this is where Espresso comes in. They have a portable screen that is so beautiful that you think Steve Jobs came back from the dead to create it. The thing is incredibly light. It comes with a nice stand and the user interface is so easy that I figured out how to do it in less than three minutes. If you listen to this podcast, you know that's not an easy feat. So the Espresso team and I, we became friends. I got to know them because I really like the product. And those screens, they now want to offer them to any fan of the podcast. So we struck a little deal. Here's how it works. 
Talks. Anyone who listens to this podcast can go to us.espres.so, or that's too confusing, just go click the link in the description. If you go to Espresso's website, they've got a brand new offer there sitting for you. You get a little discount and you'll get a beautiful screen. Trust me, I use mine every day. You'll love the Espresso screen and I think it'll make you more productive. Go check them out today by clicking on the link in the description. Absolutely. So you recently saw it with the Mark Cuban thing, which is just really funny to see that that whole kerfuffle on Twitter. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it is, it is religious in nature. I think... Uh, it, anything that that we see, this is how I think of it. Anything that we see from like DEI, ESG, all the way like in, the insane critical race theory and race Marxism that exists in our institutions today, it is religious in the sense that it is. Uh, it, it has to take a, an insane leap of faith against how reality is structured, and so people would rather again. This is what I meant earlier by like sabotage the country as opposed to instead of giving, giving, uh, letting go of of of. Uh, you know, credentialing or power structures that are no longer uh, applicable. So people will uh, would rather staff their teams, build companies, or just insist that uh, hiring or uh, building a a team is better to do so on uh, something like D uh, you know, on, on the basis of DEI or SG principles rather than uh, like you don't have to be a business you don't have to be Warren Buffett to just know like. Those things do not need to factor into building an incredible company. Uh, in fact, in many ways, doing so is is an act of like self sabotage uh, as a way to sort of a piece, uh, you know, present a uh, an offering, a peace offering, as it would, in the altar of cultural, um, of the cultural gods of uh, de jour. So what we do is we oppose that bet, uh, and we oppose it by through our through our media through our podcast or you know twitter etc just creating a everything from a just a vibe all the way to content and writing that attracts the most competent the most dynamic the most motivated people to build uh, we don't you know doesn't matter if you grew up in texas doesn't matter if you grew up in upstate new york doesn't matter if whatever like we just want you to are you are you the kind of person that sees what's going on uh and is ready to exert, are you ready to exert your will, your intellect, uh, your, your, your uh, uh, skills into carving a better f- future? That's who we attract. And this is part of the, going back to the vibe shift, I think this is part of the, uh, what we've been able to do and, and uh, a service that we've been able to provide to people like this is before, let's say Elon Musk bought Twitter, saying a lot of the stuff that is just posted now every single day on Twitter would have destroyed your life and would have gotten you, you know, canceled and kicked out of your company. James Damore famously, you know, was was killed or not killed, kicked from Google, thankfully not killed, for just asking some questions about like, are men and women really different? You know, are are men and women really interchangeable or are they distinct uh, distinct sexes? Uh, this was in like 2012. Destroyed his life, canceled, kicked out of, of Google, whatever. Uh, so before Musk buys Twitter. And it's still the case today in many, it's still increasingly the case, but, but let's say before Musk passed Twitter, a lot of these people work at places like Goldman, I work at places like Google, Facebook, like just, these are smart engineers, smart designers, smart whatever, not all of them, but a lot of them are. And they know that things are weird. They know things are weird pult- culturally, politically, but they know that they can't ask uh, or, or say anything ask questions say anything because they will be destroyed they also know that there are other people in those circles in tech in finance in business that probably think like them that know that things are weird but to find each other also means that you have to kind of expose yourself and be destroyed and so uh it, 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 the problem in our hyper sort of politicized, fractured, and dangerous times was that these kinds of people other, like had a very hard time meeting and organizing and structuring. What we've done is we fly a really public flag of courage and a positive national vision that allows these people to use us as a clearinghouse of trust in a way. They reach out via Twitter, they reach out via LinkedIn, they reach out uh, because they see us investing in different companies, whatever. Uh, and then we can air traffic control them to connect with other folks, uh, other investors, other co-found, potential co-founders, other talented people 
who think and feel the same things, but uh, but we can we're that clearinghouse of trust. We're that brokerage that, that value sort of values based arbitrage uh, connecting these people. When we see entrepreneurs today, it does feel like there's a resurgence of people who are agreeing with you. Um, many of them seem to be younger. They yeah. seem to be working on specific types of companies, hard tech, uh, et cetera. Um, is that a requirement? You have to be younger. You have to kind of not be beaten into the system. Um, and, and so in some weird way, uh, the same way young people historically have disrupted old industries. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we need to rely on young people, which, you know, as a reminder, people who literally wrote the constitution were quite young. Um, yeah. and, and so it's the young people with the radical ideas, like that is a weapon, not a, you know, negative component of this movement. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that, that's definitely part of it. I mean, increasingly, again, in that thread that I wrote, uh, uh, kind of counter signal on Paul Graham, I talk about how young people, especially, they've grown up um, surrounded by, you know, Gen Z, let's say, uh, are surrounded by um, generations who have been ignoring their eyes and ears about basic things about how the world works and uh, that have led us in many ways to the insanity and the, the, the cultural and political stagnation that we're in today. And younger people, younger guys especially, as, as evidenced by those, those charts, are saying, I'm done. Like, I'm done pretending. Um, yeah, some of those do end up, you know, going to dark places, taking the black pill, whatever. But for the most part, what I'm increasingly seeing with founders that I talk to every day is guys who just are re rediscovering uh, what, make, what makes like American men great, uh, again, <laughs> if you would. Like they want to build, they realize like, oh, I don't have to like to live the good life. I don't have to just go to Harvard and then try to go to McKinsey after that and just sort of like, you know, move to an, a coastal city and um, just, you know, suddenly I'm 70 and I hopefully have a little bit of inheritance to pass to my kids and I die. Like that, that world is disappearing and uh, younger guys are opting for real things. This is why I think we see, um, and this is why what makes me excited about this moment. Uh, you see young guys uh, rediscovering, uh, you know, uh, religion. Like a lot of these guys, if, if, have you, have you, uh, have you been to El Segundo? I have to talk to guys out, that, out there in El Segundo. I've never been, uh, but I've made a couple of investments and uh, I've gotten the full download. And uh, okay. it sounds fu fun. <laughs> no, it's super fun. So there's guys like uh, friends uh, with Augusta Dorica, who's building a, a rainmaking startup, or I say Taylor, who's building Valor Atomics. And uh, these are young guys who are, are uh, explicitly Christian. And they're building and taking some really hard bets in the world of in the world of atoms and not of bits. Uh, they're uh, surrounded themselves with other guys who are similarly as dynamic and as motivated and as almost a little bit crazy as they are. Um, and the world of SaaS, the world of keep your head down and don't don't take big swings so that you can kind of try to IPO and walk away with a big bag, is over. The world of you know. Don't say things, uh, don't call things out as you see them is, is just not appealing to young men. In general, it's just not appealing to men, period. But certainly not young men who've seen sort of the, the consequences of the result of playing that playbook uh, uh, for a while. And so go, going back to sort of the, the context of cultural and political stagnation, something that's exciting about this moment, and again, lots of historical examples and parallels with this, that in many cases, the, the times that are most fraught with political intrigue and fr uh, you know, fracture, et cetera, are also the times when you see in technology and in disruptive technology emerging and being used as a lever to break that, that as I mentioned earlier, the stalemate, stalemate or the gridlock caused by cu cultural political stagnation. So these guys are, the, the, the companies that they're building will, by the very nature of what, what they're sort of betting on, if successful, will disrupt existing power hierarchies, ex existing status hierarchies. I mean, uh, again, I say it, Taylor, a bunch of these guys are building companies that where the technology was uh, essentially developed, not fully, but developed in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And then through bureaucratization, through increasing globalization, through increasing uh, cultural and political fracture, uh, these technologies stop being developed. 
like nuclear power. You know, famously, uh, I think it was, was it Reagan wanted to build a thousand nuclear power plants, just never happened. Like nuclear bad. And like the technology was all, all there. It was just through all these, through all these macro themes that I've identified, uh, that was killed. Like, no, we can't innovate in nuclear. Well, now these guys, if successful, we're building in nuclear space or we're building in, uh, you know, alternative uh, space companies, manufacturing, whatever the case, if successful, like they will disrupt uh, a, a world that depends, a structure, an elite, as it were, that depends on them not succeeding. And that's a good thing. Now, that's a very good thing. Assets like Bitcoin or the protocol yeah. of Bitcoin being open source, it's not a single person. It's not a corporation. It's not a centralized thing. It seems to fit into this worldview and the perspective that you have, but it also in some ways is violating this, you know, people need to stand up and, and go and do this um, and, and rally resources and, and take a political stand, et cetera. How do you put those two things or kind of balance them in your head? Because Bitcoin is probably like the most apolitical thing. It's right. the thing that cares the least about culture wars. It's the thing that, you know, nobody even knows who created it. But it seems to be serving the worldview that you're presenting here. Yeah, I think that's uh, there. There's a, there's some ways in which it's synergistic, and there's some ways where um, Bitcoin and just decentralized protocols, uh, uh, like I would have a critique of them, and it's in this way. So, first, I would uh, Bitcoin as a on paper, if you just read like you know the manifesto, it is the most sort of uh, apolitical, neutral thing that you could conceive in terms of a protocol. However, if you think of like Bitcoin's goal, maybe not the goal of the protocol, but the goal of the people that use Bitcoin in America would be, some of them would say, you know, uh, it is that the, the, the objective of Bitcoin is to replace the US dollar. That's as hyper-political a, an objective or mission as you could possibly come up with. Uh, that, again, going back to my, 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 my long rants about uh, disrupting existing power structures and higher, can you talk about disrupting the uh the global hegemony of a of a uh of the dollar through a decentralized protocol so it is very in a, in a sense a lot of the aims and goals of bitcoin or those protocols are very political one critique i would have of bitcoin and just decentralized crypto protocol protocols in general is that they are and this is both a good and a bad thing they are trustless right like the whole point is like a third party uh is a is a uh uh how does the saying go? Uh, a trusted third party is always a security risk, right? In a lot of these protocols. A, to, to, build a, to build sort of a better future, to carve out uh, what we see as, as uh, what, what needs to come after the malaise, the, the cultural and political stagnation, we are going to, you are going to have to have trust-based communities. And so, how, again, to answer your question, I see... Uh, a compatibility, sort of a synergy between a decentralized trustless protocol like Bitcoin and then trust-based communities adopting that kind of protocol to build or to transact. The trust-based community uh, piece is something that's central to the new founding thesis. In fact, we think of, of uh, sort of the greatest store of value is a trust-based community. Think of a church. Um, a church, so I'll, I'll use this as an example. In a church, you'll have... Uh, you have a large body of people who share generally the same values and you know, live in proximity to one another uh, and have a uh, framing of the world that's in many ways similar. And so if you have a, if you're looking for a recommendation on anything from, you know, where to take your wife to, on a date to a babysitter to a new school for your kids, if you ask somebody in your church, you're going to ask them because you, uh, you uh, trust them. And also, because there is a sort of a body of work, an institutional memory in that group that you trust and that you want to extract a little bit of value from. What's cool is that when a person in a, in a community like that gives you a recommendation, they're staking some of the, and I'm, I'm using all these terms you know, that, are, uh, that, that, that we see in the, in, the, in the crypto space, they're staking some of their credibility in that recommendation. And if that recommendation proves true or accurate, or whatever, their credibility vis a vis you goes up. If that recommendation turns out not to be great, the credibility drops down. And so largely communities in that, that play in those dynamics, it could be a church is an example, but it could be, you know, work, it could be G, a GC, it could be any of these, these uh, trust-based communities. They will generally look out for the good of the, of the, of the network, the good of the community, 
because they're staking their personal credibility in the network of recommendations. And so this is why I think you need trust-based communities to be able to harness trustless protocols like Bitcoin. Uh, and that's in my mind sort of the best, the best of both worlds. How do you think about um Balaji's, you know, kind of the world's gonna move on chain, everything is gonna be open source, trust will be inherent, but it'll be this like automated, um, kind of auditable thing uh by anyone anywhere in the world at any time. Is he more right than wrong, or or is Bitcoin unique and like actually this won't permeate into other parts of uh culture and society? I think he's more right than wrong. I do again, and I've I've critiqued him in the past. Balaji's a friend, but uh, uh, a friend of Newfoundland, a friend of the movement. But I've critiqued this particular point, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, where you can just have a network state and let's say a, a, a new country based on uh, ab pure abstracts where people don't ever meet and there's no like grounding of that community in something that's in their real world. I think just in general, human communities tend to organize around real, like real things. Uh, and you can certainly have um, things like a, a network state based on, I don't know, a mutual love for this might sound tribe, but like a mutual love for a particular, uh, you know, movie or, uh, as he said, important like a, a, a mutual understanding about politics across the world. But I think ultimately you need to have a grounding in the physical. Uh, you need to have a grounding uh, where these communities do meet and interact in real life. Where I see his bet uh, very accurately and presently sort of going is things like AI, deep fakes, for example. Um, and AI in general, one of the one of the things that's disrupting is an old status hierarchy based on image. And so, like, as the ability to generate AI images, AI voice, AI you know, uh, audio it increases, the value of those signals in general will 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 decrease. Like, if if uh, you know, uh, um, let's say you could you're gonna to have to prove that what you're saying or if there's any content out there that's you speaking or that you've, gen you've, you've written a piece or an image that you took, um, all that stuff is gonna to go to zero in a sense, in a good way, um, through, uh, through the increase of decentralized AI technologies, for example. What will replace that is costly signals that uh, will essentially tell you whether something is real uh, or not. And these costly signals include something like courage. So moving away from a, 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 a hierarchy of image, you're moving to a hierarchy of courage. Where are people um, explicitly sending costly signals uh, like courage, like taking a, 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 you know, using tools or technologies or saying things that previously were uh, not allowed and uh, using that as an effect to sort of, again, break open uh, and carve out a way outside of existing power hierarchies. That's where I see some of his his themes really being accurate, um, moving away from uh, from existing stagnation. So let, let's just like jump forward twenty years in the future. What does this world look like? United States, we still got a uh, two party government. Is there still three branches of the government? Uh, was there a civil war? Um, yeah, you know, like, like, is it the tech uh, utopia? Like, like, what does that world look like? And I think a lot of people say, okay, cool. Everything you said so far, I'm on board with. It sounds like we're going to go build a better future, et cetera. When we get to the finish line, what does it look like? I think, yeah, that's a good question. I hope it's not a, I certainly hope it's not a civil war or anything of that sort. I do see... Um, the great sword, I think, is going to be more and more um, and so galvanized or, or uh, just become explicit in a sense. So you'll have people are, as I mentioned earlier, the themes that we're seeing generally is like young, uh, not necessarily young, but young, competent people who want to carve out a different future are starting to sort themselves out. First, by moving, let's say, to a city that's aligned with them. So leaving San Francisco to go to Miami or leaving San Francisco to go to Austin. They're moving to states that align uh, with, with their values and the future they want, to, they, they want to build. Then they're moving companies, right? And that's sort of where we're at right now. Uh, then they're moving uh, this, so, you know, COVID and post, then they're moving locations. And so they're moving from, you know, a state that they thought they would, they would die in and their kids would die in to, let's say, from California to Idaho. Or you know, from uh, Chicago to from, from Illinois to Tennessee, or some some kind of red state. 
Um, and I think that's just going to increasingly happen. People are going to, and this again, going back to questions about network state and decentralization, I think people in some ways are going to decentralize from the existing system. In some other ways, they're going to centralize with things that really matter, like living with, transacting with, uh, doing, having community with people who share their same values. So what I see the country going is a clear, uh, just clearer lines being drawn. Uh, I think it was in the midterms that certain certain swing states were ended up like, uh, I forget the names, uh, I forget the numbers, but it was like, you know, 51, 49, the Democrats, Republicans, or the other way around. I think in 20 years, we see states that are 91 or 97, uh, you know, blue or red, and then the remaining percentage, the other, like either all in on red or all in on blue. I think that's sort of the future we see. I mean, Texas right now is is sort of prototyping some of that with the the stand up against uh, the, the the border invasion, um, and I see it. I see the country moving that direction where you really have a choice. Where we're living in Idaho or living in Texas really m- makes an, a world of difference than living in California. Not just at the like, oh, you know, do I get uh, harassed in the street by homeless people or are there, you know, can I carry a gun or not? But like. Th- th- that's where we're at today. I see those differences uh, becoming starker and starker, and uh, that sort of geographical divide, that great sort, uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly taking place. I mean, it's, this is why going back to new founding, one of the bets that we recently took, one of the business lines that we we launched in the la- uh, at the end of last year, is a real estate play, and so. We're buying and developing a bunch of land in a red state and uh, in an uh, area of, of Tennessee that will will soon like announce the actual location because we're seeing this trend of people wanting to move and live and transact and just build community with other people who share their values. Of course, we're attacked by uh, you know the Guardian and others as being alt right or whatever. It has n- literally nothing to do with 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 race or anything like that. All it is is increasingly people don't want to live in a place like the Tenderloin in San Francisco, and they want to live in uh, a place where their, their kids can, you know, ride a bike in the street, where they can have a little bit of land, where uh, you can uh, enjoy natural beauty. Like, that's that's just where people want to go. And so, again, back to your question, I see the country sort of separating in those ways, self-sorting in in unique ways. If you love crime and you love, uh, you know, uh, the tenderloin, you can make your state the tenderloin. Uh, and if you love uh, things like Idaho or Texas has to offer, you can make your state more like that. What are the potential pitfalls for this happening? I feel like there's a lot of momentum right now. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Joe Biden gets elected, uh, <laughs> reelected. Does that like, yeah. you know, kind of suck the air out of the room and, and put a stop to it? Or, or what are the things that you feel like um, are, are things that could uh, be friction points for this friction points? Forward. Yeah, some of it is is certainly political. Uh, I think Biden uh, and existing you know, the current uh, with the cathedral, the the regime, however you want to call it, the blob, uh, continuing to exercise power could certainly prove to increase the stakes for anybody. Again, whether you politic you think of yourself as political or not, building in ways that would eventually disrupt existing power hierarchy structures. Uh, so that's one of the pitfalls. Um, although I think if something like that happens, it's going to have to accelerate the involvement of people who previously saw themselves as non-political and turn them into very, very, very political actors. Elon Musk is one of, is the best example of this. Like he is, I think he's starting to realize that if the blue states, as it were, Blue America has its way. He will not succeed in in building his dream of getting to Mars. And you know, ten years ago, he just wanted to build and he just wanted to go, and everybody just kind of let him go, and that's cool. And uh, he's kind of an eccentric billionaire, and d- d- doesn't matter. Now he's at the point where, like, oh, a couple of cracked eggs, you know, outside the launch pad of Starship means that we shut you down and you can't launch any ships, you know, or just some insane bureaucratization. Again, we're going back to my themes, like bureaucratization that just will neuter, attempt to neuter his enterprising spirit and everything he's kind of built. And so if uh, if the, the regime only increases on power, I see guys like Elon really having to 
to become hyper political uh, and having to take like direct explicit stance and say, no, you're not going to stop me. I'm getting to Mars or I'm going to go do this thing uh, in ways that they would not have foreseen 10 years ago. Another, another potential pitfall and, and um, obstacle, I would say, is like building in, like seeing the political and cultural decline that's around us, but not carving out a competent, uh, positive vision and instead tr trying to build or grift out of a, uh, a sort of a pure reaction to what's going on around us. The example of this would be, and this is what we've always, we'll always stay clear to this in our branding and our stags and our messaging, the sort of like anti-woke or, uh, you know, expert for conservatives type of branding or framing or investing, because those things are pure uh, uh, fads in a sense. Like there are a lot of companies that came out of the COVID stuff that were like, we are so-and-so, but anti-vax, or we are so-so anti-woke. And like wokeness as a brand is going away. And so if you've, if you've branded yourself, if you've positioned yourself as purely like this thing, but not woke or this thing, but not crazy, uh, that's not enough to, to, to become a lasting business or message or, or legacy. Instead, uh, I think people ought to build uh, good things. Like people go build real things, take hold of the world as it is, like take the Dominion mandate seriously and frame yourself, whether it is you're, you're a founder building an interesting company in California or in Texas, or you're an investor or you're a you know, content creator, like position yourself as somebody just building. Um, I mean, this is what, in, in a sense, what right wing means at, at this point is just you look at the world and align with reality. That's it. Build, align with reality. Don't build react in terms of reactions. Don't say we're this, but not woke. We're this, but not, you know, for conservatives, just build good things, just build really good things. And you'll avoid that pitfall of just becoming a fad to yourself. What is the thing internally that you guys talk about the most that would surprise people externally? I think uh, going back to something I said earlier is building the coalition across these uh, a cultural, commercial, political coalition across the circles that new founding touches. Uh, again, we we enjoy uh, an interesting position where we talk to, you know, Christians. We talk to Bitcoiners, to crypto guys. We talk to uh, venture capitalists, uh, cultural jun uh, and political junkies, and we're sort of at the center. I mean, our podcast is itself a a way to uh, publicly, tactfully, if you would like display that we overlap with all these circles. And there's lots of interesting ideas that would typically not cross these circles because, you know, a pastor may not be following biology or biology may not be following a right wing and on who has some interesting thoughts about uh, how rural Appalachia is, you know, reconstructing itself or whatever. And we can broker these conversations. So one of the things that, uh, one of the conversations that, that would surprise people and, and people always enjoy when they come to our office or they, they interact with us is, how we were able to broker connections between these otherwise disparate groups that are increasingly finding themselves as allies in the in the culture wars, and uh, and that's also was something that we talk about a lot. Like, how do you do that with wisdom? How do you do that in a way that creates uh, good avenues for uh, again commerce and and cultural affinity? There are some ways in which these groups will not fully align with each other. There's other ways in which they can be great allies, and so we see. Uh, our responsibility in some ways as being a, a good stewards of the fact that we're in the middle of all, all these all these communities and helping them interact with, uh, organize uh, alongside and, and transact with each other in interesting ways. Like I, I, that's I think also one of the things that makes us very different from someone like other pro-American vitalism sort of firms and companies out there where we explicitly uh, call out the fact that we have connections and access to all these groups combined um, and are able to make introductions and broker uh, relationships between them. And, and then when you think about um, the fund that you guys are uh, currently managing, talk a little bit about how is the fund structured? Is it all early stage investing? Will you guys kind of go outside of the normal means? Like you, you thinking differently about the way the world is in the future. Does traditional venture capital fit into how to fund that stuff or is there a different model that you need yeah good question so uh i'll talk i'll, I'll take a step back and just talk about new founding in general and then how the fund comes about because i okay. think it'll, i'll answer your question a little bit so uh as i mentioned new founding was essentially 
at, at its purest form, we've become, we were launched as a rallying point, a gravity well to attract all these people that were dissatisfied with the status quo, who wanted to build real competent things, uh, but needed help finding each other organizing. So we built a couple companies ourselves, uh, exited two brands to the blaze last year. We built, as part of that network, uh, we built a talent network where we're connecting employers and companies and startups that want to hire these kinds of people, uh, these kinds of people, and uh, and these kinds of employers or employees connect them with the, with the startups, right? Um, then um, one thing I launched last year, uh, beginning of it was like March or, or April, was something I called the Deal Room, which again through our network through our podcasting, we were just getting hit left, right, and center with on the one hand founders who. We're seeing our our public messaging, our 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 Twitter, our uh, podcast, whatever, and we're like, "Hey, I love what you're building. I'm bu I'm building an interesting company. Uh, if you know of any investors who want to invest in this space, let me know." On the flip side, the deal room also built, uh, you know, so the founders on one side, on the other hand, uh, uh, attracting investors who wanted to invest in these kinds of founders, and so very quickly found ourselves building a uh, a really good uh, deal flow pipeline and a really good LP pipeline. And uh, of people that were values aligned and wanted to build in the same spaces, et cetera. Two years ago, we considered starting a fund, but the markets were so nuts that we didn't want to, we wanted to just sort of see where they, they where they're gonna go. Uh, at the end of last year, having built really good deal flow, a good pipeline, having a strong network, having a lot of the talent component figured out, we decided to launch the fund. Um, uh, it's still a you know hard fundraising environment, but to your question, this means that uh, venture pricing is attractive for you know firms and LPs, and also on the deal side, like companies, the guys that are building uh, building companies that are uh, founding companies have to build real things. They can't you can't just build. We're past the age of just building like the 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 twentieth note taking app or the you know, uh, 10th uh, Calendly clone or copycat SaaS or any of that stuff. In general, just founders are steering away from that for cultural and political reasons that I've outlined, but also venture firms just want to move away from that stuff. Uh, it's, it's sort of a tapped out market. Uh, instead, it's, we're, moving, we're seeing uh, you know, a shift towards uh, deep tech, through, towards uh, defense tech, and to and when it comes to software, it's like software enabled big swing, you know, insert big, big problem that you want to tackle. Uh, and so our fund is structured in a way to take advantage of the themes that I outlined earlier and the, the response to those themes. So any any company that is solving a critical problem uh, that emerges out of an increase in globalization, that emerges out of an increase in bureaucratization, that emerges out of increase in political and cultural alienation. A company that solves those, uh, we we're we're after. This means like you know, looking at deals that are that that something like American Dynamism would would also take a look. But it also means looking at other deals that uh, will be better fit for us because of our connections across the the Venn diagram of circles that we touch. So we invested in a uh, uh, ad tech platform that is outside of uh, you know Facebook, Google. Facebook and Google don't allow any kind of firearms or firearms adjacent advertising. And so these guys, Arminet, they build the fastest growing uh, endemic ad network for the firearms space in about seven months. And they came to us because they liked, you know, just our, our, our aesthetic, our, our vision, but also because they recognized that we could help them accelerate their, their, uh, their market adoption. Like we essentially have become, because of our connections in, 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 across those networks, we can be kingmakers in a way for companies that fit that profile. So our minute comes to us, they're working with some of the top uh, gun manufacturers and publishers uh, to create the ad network. But, you know, we invest uh, capital into, into our minute. We like them a lot. Within hours of uh, getting to work with those guys, we're able to pick up the phone and have uh, conservative uh, publications write pieces on them. We're able to introduce them to customers who are looking for this kind of solution. Again, disenfranchised, uh, very motivated customers who want to move to a disruptive alternative. That's where we can we have an edge. Uh, any kind of deal that allows for that kind of uh, that kind of transaction to happen. Talk about um, 
the team that you all are putting together as well um, across the organization. It feels like uh, you have a unique combination of people who are uh, very steadfast in their beliefs, uh, people who have a very long track record of building successful organizations and products, and then a group of people who are young, hungry, entrepreneurial kind of uh, you know great operators. And when I look at the group, it looks like uh, on a whole, this is a a very uh, different but also a potentially very valuable group of people that you all seem to be bringing together? Yeah, so I think our, our own team reflects the nature of, of the network that we've built and the kind of people that we attract. Um, sort of the uh, people who either built careers uh, uh, or wealth outside of traditional hierarchy structures. So Nate, our founder, he went to Harvard Law, he got a JD, but instead of practicing, he, was, he had a bunch of offers from top law firms uh, instead of practicing and taking those law, uh, those those offers, he partnered with a classmate to buy a bunch of distressed apartments in Texas and Florida. And like, you know, there's the high status life. This is what I go back to. You know, if if people listening to this sense of theme here, it is a theme. There's the high status, easy sort of life in terms of the old credentialing and power structures available to a bunch of these guys, a bunch of a bunch of us on our team. And instead, we decide to do something that's non-consensus, that's a macro bet in a particular direction, seeing where the, cult, the, the country, culture, politics, et cetera, tech is going to go. So Nate does that, and then he built a very, very successful real estate company through that. And then looking for the next macro bet, new founding was, was that thing. Uh, one of the other partners, Josh Abatoy, he also, uh, he did practice. He, he's a lawyer also by trade, a very successful M&A guy. Uh, but decided like the rest of us that he was, he had kind of two options in 2020, 2021. He could keep his head down and continue that cushy sort of, you know, diminished life in terms of his, his agency in an increasingly hostile and volatile cultural and political time, or he could take, he could exit. He could take the, the, the step, uh, the leap of faith and become public about his views, become public about, use the same skills that he was using to increase the influence and power of ultimately the people that hated what we love and use those same skills and, and, and effort uh, to build the country he wants to live in. That's Josh Abato. Again, all the guys on the team, we've had, we have similar stories. We were in bureaucrat bureaucratized uh, corporations. We were at companies that were good, but the, the cultural alignment with those was increasingly impossible to reconcile with what we what we believed, uh, and we wanted to carve out a different future. We also saw the this was sort of the right time to do it. The tools, especially you know something like Twitter being now our platform as opposed to the left's platform, the tools and the 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 appetite for something different are all available now. And um, the team we've we've assembled. Uh, we're ready to take advantage of the of the cultural moment. It is fraught with danger, but it's also fraught with uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, again, we're representative of the kind of guy, the kind of person that we attract to our network. Somebody that that wants to exit. Somebody wants to say, "I'm done pretending. I'm ready to build real things." What have I not asked you that I should ask you in terms of uh, the vision of the world, what you guys are building, and where you think all this is going? Ah, that's a great question. And to ask myself a question here. Um, one, one question that we get a lot uh, that you haven't asked here is just how can people, some, you know, we, new founding has very clear uh, sort of uh, mandates or objectives across our venture fund, across our talent network, across our real estate uh, play. But a lot of people just reach out saying like, hey, I like new founding. Like, what do I how, how can I help the movement? You know, like they see something that's, that's interesting. Uh, we're always happy to chat with people like that. Uh, we may not have either an, an internal product or business line that we're developing that, that allows that person to plug into new founding itself. But because of our network and the, again, the, the coverage across all these interesting Venn diagrams uh, or the circles in the Venn diagram that I described, we're generally very able to, to air traffic control people and say, hey, you, you're a you know, very competent founder or investor and you want to uh, do some consulting on the side or advisory, we're able to introduce you to another company or you want to do uh, 
you're building a company and you want us to help uh, help you with marketing or customer introductions or investor, whatever the case may be, uh, our our network sort of um, overextends yeah, or or rather is bigger than our current business lines in a way. And so we're always able to help or try to help enterprising dynamic guys uh, find a way to plug into the movement as it were uh, and connect them with other guys who are, or companies or investors or business or whatever who are aiming in the same direction. Um, that's not something that we, we again, it's, there's not like an entry door for that on our website or anything like that, but we, we do it all the time. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about new founding? Yeah. So newfounding.com is our website. Uh, people can follow me at Sants, S-A-N-T-S, Liego, uh, on Twitter or X. Um, and if the, uh, you resonate, if people resonate with this uh, with, with this interview, and they want to find aligned work or hire people who would resonate with this interview, they can go to newfounding.com/talent. If you want to check out our fund, go to newfounding.com/venturefund. Uh, throw us a little, you know, come check it out. Throw us a little in there. Uh, see how we can do for you. Like we we see amazing uh, deal flow. Work alongside some of the best investors in the world. Uh, and I have a strong conviction that we're betting in the direction the country's going in. I love it. I learned a lot today. Thank you very much for your time. Um, it, it is uh, rare in today's world for people to not only have a strong view of where they think the world is going, but be willing to make a bet on it. And so I commend you and, and everyone else over at New Founding for, uh, for for kind of drawing a line in the sand and saying this is what we believe. Uh, it takes courage. And and frankly, there's not a lot of people willing to do that in uh, in kind of the digital age. So uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty fascinating to watch. Um, and uh, Thanks, as you guys Bob. continue to be successful, we'll, we'll definitely do this again in the future. Yeah, let's do it. Great, yeah, great speaking, and thanks for having me on.